for singing for the Lord. I guess it's like a lot of preaching, meaning, well, I was in one church anyway, and got a new tr church, ended up splitting, had a new preacher, and we were practicing one afternoon, four or five of us, and uh, he just zipped by there, and he grabbed my psalm book off the stand, and, and he flipped to it, and he put it back, and he started away, and he said, I want a copy of that. I said, no. He turned around and said, what do you mean, no? He said, I could tell you what to sing to go with my sermons. I said, somebody's already doing that. Yeah. One dark night down in Egypt, a fearful time had come. A young Hebrew boy was his father's firstborn son. The angel of death would be passing by, would be hard to fall asleep. But one little lamb was on his mind as he lay there down in sheep. He wondered why his young lamb had to die, why his blood was on the door. Through the wind and rain, would it still remain? Oh, he wanted to be sure. So he called out to the father with a trembling voice so scared, saying, Father, please, will you look and see if the blood is still there? He said, son, now don't you worry, for the blood is there to stay. Though the winds may blow and the rains may fall, it just won't wash away. And it will endure the raging storm. It's been a fight with love and care. Assured you can rest secure that the blood is still there. When we come to face life's problems, though they seem to never end, we still have that promise from our Savior and our friend. blood that Jesus shed back then is still as fresh today so we don't ever have to ask if the blood is there to stay he said son now don't you worry for the blood is there to stay Oh, the winds may blow and the rains may fall, it just won't wash away. And it will endure the raging storms it's been applied with love and care. So be assured you can rest secure that the blood Bless the Lord for all he's done. All right, that says power, so I guess we're good to go. Acts chapter 24. After, uh, after Brother Ellis preached last night, I got to scribbling about three quarters of the way through, and uh, for all for all the life of me, I wanted to go back to that very same place, to Ephesians chapter two today. The Lord ran a thought 
by my mind when Brother Alice was there last night that uh, the grace of God, it covers it all. Amen. Covers it all this side of heaven. And of course we read on about that very same verse that in the ages to come He may show the exceeding riches of His grace. I wrote down in my Bible, enough grace for two lifetimes. Some of you got it. <laughs> enough grace for this lifetime and enough grace for the eternal life. For all I wanted, I wanted to go there today, but as I woke up and prayed and, and asked the Lord this morning, I think we need to be over here. Uh, Acts 24, I'm going to read. You can tip me for that outline later on. I said, okay. <laughs> Acts chapter 24 and verse 14 through 16. We'll read three verses. Give you my thought, we'll pray, and we'll move on from there. Acts chapter 24 and verse 14. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets, and have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. And herein do I exercise myself to, always, to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. My thought's very simple, and it's for us as we move on this afternoon back into the areas of serving Him that He has lined up for us, but it's for us as we move on back on into our lives, as we travel back home, and as we pray for the good grace of God that we need to continue on serving Him faithfully as we live for Him. My thought simply this. Brothers, sisters, here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. Our Father, we thank you so very much. Oh Lord, for what you've done this week. It's been said many a time that we certainly have no idea. Our eyes have seen some things and it has been wonderful. Lord, many has given testimony that it's just overwhelming. It's, so, it's just beyond what we could put words to. Father, that's you. That's what you do. And you allow us to be a part of all that you're doing. Lord, we thank you so very much. Now, Father, as much as I thank you for all that you've done, help me and help us not to live on yesterday's blessings. Help us to move forward remembering yesterday's blessings, but expecting you to do more today. Now, Father, we'd ask you today, please, in these next few minutes, that you'd help us, Lord, to lay down those things that are a vying, a fighting for our, our minds, our attention. Lord, that your grace, which we know is sufficient, that we might tap into that grace one more time, that we may hear what you have to say to your people. Father, thank you for your word. We thank you that it is your eternal word that does the changing. And Father, we ask these things in that mighty name of our Savior, that wonderful name of your only begotten, Jesus Christ. Amen. amen. And amen. Here's what we're going to do. Paul was accused of all kinds of stuff in the earlier parts of this chapter. If you read it through, you'll find all kinds of accusations. Verses 5 and 6 is where you'll see it. Chapter 24 and verse 5 says, For we found this man a pestilent fellow. Boy, that God would compliment us, that we might be accused of the same. A pestilent fellow, a mover of sedition among the Jews throughout the world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes who also have gone about to profane the temple 
whom we took and would have judged according to our law. Accused of being a pestilent fellow, a mover of sedition, a ringleader of a sect, a profaner of the temple. And as we move on through the chapter, Paul defends himself and denies most of these things. Verse 10, Then Paul, after the governor had beckoned unto him to speak, answered, For as much as I know that thou hast been of many years a judge unto this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself, because that thou mayest understand that there are yet but twelve days since I went up to Jerusalem for to worship, and they neither found me in the temple disputing with any man, neither raising up the people, neither in the synagogues, nor in the city. Neither can they prove the things whereof they accuse me. He defends himself, he defends these things that they've accused him of, but one thing he confesses. One thing he's willing to say, yep, I did do that. One thing he's willing to say, they're accusing me of this and I can't deny that one. But this I confess unto thee, Paul said. Just let me ask you this. You think the Bible says that Paul said, I do, more, I do the more cheerfully answer for myself. He's talking to the the judge, he knows that judge, that governor, had been around for some years. And so I do the more cheerfully speak. I do, the, do all the more cheerfully answer for myself. You think he was all the more cheerful because that judge was a renowned judge, a known judge? He was a judge that he thought would see the case fairly and set him free. You think that's why he was more cheerful? You think maybe he was cheerful before that judge because he would get the chance to plead his case that he might actually not be accused and sent to He might get away with the things that... You think that's why he, had the, he was cheerful to defend himself before the judge? No, I believe he was cheerful to answer for himself before the judge because he had something to confess. I think he was cheerful before that judge of renown, that judge that was known, that judge that had great authority, that judge that would have been known by many, that judge that had such a place of influence. He thought, I have a chance to confess Jesus. And so I'm going before him cheerfully. I'm going before him and I'll gladly answer for myself. I'll defend myself for the things I didn't do, but I will cheerfully confess the thing I did do. I shared Jesus Christ. I told about Jesus Christ. I testified about my Jesus. Thank God Paul was willing to cheerfully go before the judge to confess Jesus Christ. But I confess unto thee. You may say, well, hold on a second. Where's Jesus in these verses, in the text verses we read? He's not there. You're right. He's not. At least not in name. But let's read on. Verse 22 tells us, And when Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way, he deferred them and said, When Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of your matter. And he commanded a centurion to keep Paul. Boy, we got a judge, we got Felix, we've got Lysias, the chief captain. Now we have a centurion coming down. God's bringing them in. He commanded a centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty, that he should forbid none of his acquaintance to minister or to come unto him. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. And he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. Felix trembled. <laughs> he came and he was joyful. 
to preach Jesus and God did more than Paul may have been expecting. God said, hold up just there a second, Paul. Bible says in a few days later, Paul, Paul, uh, God brought this other bunch in. I got to thinking about this week. I got to thinking about how we thought. Could it work? Could it not work? Radios, fence services, what in the world's going to happen? But I'm telling you, God brought the fire drill. God brought those white garments out. God did everything He needed to do because He saw someone that wanted to confess Jesus. What a God we serve. Paul confessing Christ led to the Holy Ghost convicting Felix. Now Felix's response wasn't right there. Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I'll call for thee. Boy, we have some folks like that, don't we? They'll listen, they'll hear us, but they're, they're, they're under conviction. That young man that you mentioned the other day, three times, three different men had the opportunity, and that young man said, just not today. Nothing new, is it? But just keep pressing on. Thank God that Paul was willing to see the opportunity before that judge and was willing to joyfully confess Christ. Here's what we're going to do, folks. We're going to keep confessing Christ. Secondly, we're going to keep worshiping God. Verse 14. First thing we're going to do, we're going to confess Christ. Second thing we're going to do, that after the way which they call heresy... So worship I the God of my fathers. What was the heresy? Well, back then, Jesus was not the Messiah. He was not the Son of God. Over in the Gospels, we hear that that bunch called Him a deceiver, called Him a liar. The heresy was that Jesus is a blasphemer. What's the heresy today? That's not the only true religion. You bunch don't have the only way to heaven. God loves everyone and He'll accept everything. Jesus died for all, therefore all are going to heaven, right? Jesus is not the only way. He's not the Son of God. There's no hell. We're willing to accept there might be a heaven. There's no God. There's no absolutes. Everything's relative anyway. Heresy, heresy, heresy. that after the way which they call heresy, so I worship the God of my fathers. He is my God. <laughs> he is the Son of God. He is the Lord. He is the Lord of lords. He is the King of kings. He is the only way to heaven. He is loving everyone, but He is not accepting everything. He did die for all, but that does not mean all are headed for heaven. He is the only way. He is the Son of God. There is a heaven and there is a hell. He is our God and what they call heresy. I'm going to worship that God of my fathers by His grace. God help us to do the same. We're going to keep on confessing Christ. We're going to keep on worshiping God. Can I just remind us that a part of worshiping God is staying faithful to the church house? Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some. We remember that second verse, but those two are tied together. When we're in church, we need to be considering one another to provoke unto love and to good works. 
You know, I scribbled something down this morning for every one of us that will be preaching today. Let's not forget, God gave every one of us our own character, our own personality. We all preach with a a different style, a different way. I can't find the right words. You know what I'm saying. But let's not forget where we were before God called us and before God saved us. If we're not taking the message as straight and as direct as it needs to be that there is a heaven and there is a hell, but if we're not taking it with an attitude of love, with an attitude of understanding that you, dear soul, are going to live there forever, if we're doing it with some kind of a belligerent attitude, if you're telling them about hell, telling them about the lake of fire, tell them about life eternal, but don't you tell them like it's something they deserve and you don't. We all deserve hell. We still should be in hell. We deserve that place too. Take your message. But remember you deserve the very same thing you're telling them about. We're going to keep confessing Christ. We're going to keep worshipping God. We're going to keep believing God's Word. Believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. Boy, I don't know about you. We've heard it said already this week. I still believe this God, this world was created. Still believe this world was spoken into being. I still believe the stories of the Bible are historical accounts of real events. I still believe that the characters of the Bible were real people that struggled with real struggles just like you and I do, lived real lives just like you and I do you and me good to read the Bible that way. I still believe the prophecies that foretold Christ were true and fulfilled. I still believe that every one of them's just about done but one. And that's His return to us. But I also still believe He didn't forget that one. He's coming back. He's coming back. We're going to keep believing God's Word. I still believe in the birth, the death, the resurrection of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I still believe in the ascension. I still believe in the Holy Ghost living in me. I still believe the one prophecy that's remaining. I'm believing all things that are written, but be careful. Be careful. I want to show you something the Lord reminded me about this morning. Turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 24. You remember that road to Damascus? I'm not going to read through the whole chapter. I'll just run through a few verses. Luke chapter 24, verse 13. We're talking about we're going to keep believing God's Word. Luke 24 and verse 13. Behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about threescore furlongs, and they talked together of all the things which had happened. And it came to pass, while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus Himself drew near and went with them. Their eyes were holden, that they should not know Him. And He said unto them, What manner of communications are these that you have one to another as you walk, and are sad? Go to verse 21. They've told the Lord about all the stuff they'd seen happen. They were sad. Their countenance was low. Verse 21, they said, But we trusted that it had been He would... I'm sorry, but we trusted that it had been He which should have redeemed Israel. Besides all this, today is the third day since these things were done. I wrote my Bible this morning. But I trusted you, Lord. I trusted you. Ever been there? You just, for all the world, looks like he didn't hear you, he didn't answer you, and now it's too late. I trusted you, Lord. Verse 24. 
Certain of them which were with us went to the sepulchre and found it, even so as the women had said, but him they saw not. You ready for a sting? Then he said unto them, O fools. I wonder how many times the Lord would have looked at me and said, Mark, you fool. Now don't you dare let that devil of your flesh run round in your mind saying God is in the business of trying to call you out, name you, and put you down and make you feel like a fool, like an idiot. That's not God. But he will tell you the truth. He will tell me I've been a straight up fool because I didn't believe the whole story. You see... These folks were willing to believe the prophecies of the Old Testament. They were willing to believe this could be Jesus when He was walking among them. They were really willing to believe as they followed Him around and they saw the miracles that He did among them and among the people. And they're even willing to keep believing as they saw all that that they were doing to the Lord. They took Him to the cross. They nailed Him to the cross. But He died there. And he wound up in that tomb. And he's been dead three days. Oh, they were willing to believe everything from Genesis all the way up to the crucifixion. But they weren't willing to believe those verses that said he'd rise again. They weren't willing to believe the whole story. They saw it all the way up to here. But life come in. Pressures came in. Problems came in. And they lost sight of the end of the story. Mark, you fool. How many times, how many times have I been willing to believe Him until the trouble hit? How many times have I been willing to hold on to that belief, knowing, believing the Word of God until that one that just tipped me over the edge? That grace that Brother Ellis preached about last night. You know what happened? That grace is still there. I just stopped looking for it. I stopped reaching for it. Stopped stretching out for it. We're going to keep believing the Word of God. We're going to keep confessing Christ. We're going to keep worshiping God. We're going to keep believing God's Word We're going to keep hoping in God. Verse 15, And have hope toward God, which they themselves also allow that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. I got to thinking, I wrote on a scrap of paper here, some of the stuff I've heard as we've run through this whole COVID thing. I'm not putting down on this. It's all good and it's all true. God is in control. God's still on the throne. God's still sovereign. God will still do what He will do. God's ways will not be frustrated. Our hope is not in the White House. Our hope's in God. Amen. Our trust is not in men, but our trust is in God. Amen. I may be the only one here, and I may be the only one. The Lord run a thought through my mind and I scribbled it down. I said, yep, all that's true, but sometimes there's a problem. Sometimes, if I'm honest, that statement of my hope is in God and my trust is in the Lord, it's attached to the life I'm living right now. Sometimes that hope and trust is attached to the comfort I'm enjoying. Sometimes that hope and trust is attached to the freedom, the very freedoms I have. As if somehow I'm clinging to the crazy idea that if I say it enough, make myself believe it enough, God will let me keep my comforts, He'll let me keep my life as it is now, and He'll let me keep my freedoms. My trust in God needs to be based more on my life as it is now. 
My trust in God needs to be based more on the things God's given me and blessed me with, and I thank Him for them. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, my trust in God needs to be based on more than the very freedoms He's given me. So does yours. And so does yours. If we're going to keep hoping in God, there is a hope which they themselves out there also allow that there may be a resurrection of the dead. You remember those school years that you thought would never end? <laughs> Pretty recent for you guys. <laughs> Some of us have to go way back to remember those. <laughs> Must have been rough because we all remember them, don't we? <laughs> Remember that struggle that just seemed to last forever? You may be in one now. You remember that job you thought would never finish? Remember that test that seemed to go on for a lifetime? You remember that exam you couldn't see the end of? <laughs> you remember those books you read or some famous person that you looked up to? And now they're off the scene, or they're not cool anymore, or they just got old in your eyes. Maybe they're dead now. Their life seemed as endless to them as yours does to yours right now. And so it is with life. The hours turn into days, and the days turn into weeks. The weeks turn into months. The months turn into years. And God said, for what is your life? It's even a vapor. It appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. Oh, how we need to hope in God. Oh, how we need to have hope toward God. He is our hope, not our things. He is our hope, not our stuff. He is our hope, not our life, our comfort, the way we know our life to be. I hope we don't face it, but if we do, our hope had better be in Him and Him alone, not even in the freedoms we are so blessed to enjoy. Our hope is in God and God alone. There shall be a resurrection of the dead. But I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others, <laughs> which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which also sleep in Jesus will God bring with Him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord <laughs> shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now don't miss this verse. Wherefore, comfort one another. <laughs> with these words. Can I put it like this? I like to just stop every now and again and pinch myself and remind myself, this thing's real. He's real. <laughs> I'm headed that way. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're going to keep confessing Christ. We're going to keep worshiping God. Lastly, we're going to keep exercising ourselves. Verse 16, and herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. To exercise, to train, to form, to, to build or expand. What's the exercise? Well, we're not talking about the gym. We're not talking about those pull-ups, push-ups, or any other kind of ups. We're not talking about getting out there and running and walking every day, though it'd be good if you do that. We're not talking about any of that stuff. We're talking about exercising a conscience. That's tough exercise. A conscience void of offense toward God and man. Now notice, 
the Bible does not say God or man. This isn't talking about who do I choose, God or man. Who do I offend? Do I offend God or do I offend man? The Bible says that I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Now notice, the offense isn't toward. The offense caused isn't directed to God or man. The offense caused is your conscience. I don't want my conscience to be offended toward God or man. It's not about offending others. It's not about not offending others. It's about your conscience not being offended. Your conscience not being caused to stumble. Your conscience not being being caused to trip and fall. Your conscience not being led down the road of sin. In other words, keep living right. Keep living pure. Keep doing right. Keep doing what God has told you to do. Don't give up now. Don't give up tomorrow. Don't give up next week or next year. Don't give up the day before the Lord takes you home. Just keep doing what's right. Keep confessing Christ. Keep worshiping God. Keep believing the Word of God. And keep having hope toward God. You will keep your conscience void of offense toward God and man. Oh, people may get offended. Well, I'll go a step further. People will get offended. (laughs) We know that. We know that. But oh God, oh God, if I could live a day when my conscience wasn't offended, at least once. (laughs) Did you hear what I said? If I could live a day without my conscience being offended just once. And yet we're to live our lives that way. My, my, my. Sister Ellis, may I ask you humbly please, would you come play for us for a few moments? Thank you. I wonder as we've battled on through the, this last year and the struggles and the ups and the downs, and we must have talked this thing around a million times. <laughs> Just had it on my heart to remind us again today that in the middle of all this, no matter what out there does, says, looks like, or sounds like, here's what we're going to do. By that grace of God that covers it all, we're going to keep confessing Christ. By the grace of God that covers it all, we're going to keep worshiping God. By the grace of God that covers it all, we're going to keep believing the precious, wonderful Word of God. By the grace of God that covers it all, we're going to keep hoping in Him by the grace of God that covers it all. And it is only His grace that will do it. We're going to keep exercising ourselves that our conscience may be void of offense toward God, toward man. I just want to ask as we finish up this morning, you want to come to the altar, come on to the altar if you'd like to pray where you are. But let's give some time to ask God that His grace would be so abundant this afternoon that He would keep us, our spiritual eyes, on our hands reaching out for that all-sufficient grace that as we go this afternoon, we'll keep confessing Him, we'll worship Him. <laughs> Keep our conscience clean as we do it. Our Father, we thank you so very much for your goodness today and we thank you for your word. We thank you for all that you have in plan this afternoon. And Lord, beyond that, as we go back to our various homes this evening, I know some of us won't meet again once we break up after lunch. I just pray, dear God, please, 
please, Father, watch over us as we go. And would you send that one by us one more time that's ready to receive your truth. Father, we thank you. Hear our prayers now as we give some time to you. In Jesus' name, amen.